Computer vision, what people with vision impairments experience and want. Moderator, Abigail Stangle, NSF CRA Computing Innovation Fellow, University of Washington. First speaker, Stephanie Ingyart, Chief Public Policy and Research Officer, American Foundation for the Blind. Speaker, Robin Christopherson, Head of Digital Inclusion, AbilityNet. Speaker, Daniel Kish, President, World Access for the Blind. Okay, well, it's great. It's a great pleasure to have the three of you here today. Uh, welcome to our Vizwa's Grand Challenge Workshop panel, where I have the pleasure of speaking with three special guests who will share about their vast experiences advocating for people who are blind or have visual impairments, and from their own experiences as people with visual impairments and who, who use and develop access technologies. My name is Abigail Stengel, and I am a CRA NSF Computing Innovation Fellow. My work is at the intersection of human-computer interaction, non-visual accessibility, and data privacy and ownership, and I work at the University of Washington. So a key goal of the VizWiz Grand Challenge is to cultivate conversations between people with visual impairments and the computer vision community so that research products, services that make use of machine learning are developed in an inclusive manner and are reflective of blind people's leadership and the community's interests. So our three speakers have graciously agreed to help us cultivate this conversation. Thank you in advance to each of you. Before we dive in, I wanna share a bit more about each of our guests and why we are fortunate to have you all here. Um, so first, we have Stephanie Enyart, the Chief Public Policy and Research Officer at the American Foundation for the Blind. Stephanie serves as a strategic leader in developing policy that benefits people who are blind in education, employment, aging, and the intersectional issues of technology and transportation. I remember first learning of Stephanie through your work as a graduate student when you filed and won a lawsuit that now ensures that testing entities are required to provide accommodations that ensure that exams measure a test taker's ability rather than the impact of a test taker's disability. Thank you so much for that work. We also have with us Robin Christofferson, who is the head of digital inclusion at AbilityNet. Robin has been pro a prolific advocate for the power of digital technology in transforming people's lives. His work has led to accessibility improvements in business, government, universities, and many other organizations. Robin is not only an expert in accessibility auditing, but has served as an expert technical witness in the area of assistive technology and software systems and websites. And Robin has received numerous honors for his leadership in digital inclusion. Finally, we have Daniel Kish, the president of World Access for the Blind, who has, a long, has long served as an advocate for the development of new technologies that, that support the independence of blind people. He's a world leader in perceptual navigation and echolocation, through which he has developed his own method of generating vocal clicks and using echoes to identify his surroundings and navigate. It really is an honor to be with each of you here today. And so without further ado, Let's start with learning a bit more about your work in representing people with visual impairments. Um, how about we start with Robin for this question. Um, how did you get into your current line of work? Thank you so much. Um, really good to be on. Uh, so I'm head of digital inclusion at a UK technology and disability charity, as you said there, AbilityNet. And I've been with AbilityNet for the last 26 years. I was one of the co-founders uh, when it was spun off from a special needs uh, product department of IBM. They realized that there was a, an awful lot more out there than just um, the products that they had. And so AbilityNet, we're a pan-disability organization. And that's really, really helpful because talking about intersectional intersectionality, there's an awful lot of um, implications of multiple disabilities and impairments. And, you know, we're, we're not all kind of, we don't just get the one disability, certainly as we age, other things creep in if we uh, don't get a, a rich mixture earlier on in life. So it's really important to have this multi uh, disability or, or impairment approach. Um, but yeah, I'm blind myself. Um, I did engineering at Cambridge and soon realized that um, that wasn't going to be really realistic a career for me. So then I started to do maths uh, as a teacher, secondary teacher. And I realized that you need to have eyes in the back of your head if you're a teacher in a secondary school. And when the ones in the front of your head don't work, then that was really challenging. So I very soon 
went to IT and, you know, I've been um, in that field ever since and have been lucky enough to be working with, as you mentioned, you know, companies. We do, we have a lot of services that we provide to companies. Uh, we advise government. I sit on various committees. They're called all party parliamentary groups over here. Uh, where it tries to impact on policy and strategy, et cetera. So, yeah, I've been embedded uh, in the world of, um, I would say, the coalface world of of disability um, for well over two decades. And just it's like being paid to play, basically, with the latest technologies, including AI and machine learning and stuff like that, which hopefully we're going to touch upon a little bit today. Wonderful. Thank you. Stephanie, how about you? Sure. So I uh, acquired a visual disability as a teenager, um, and I'm from a very rural part of California. So I quickly realized I needed to find a way to get out. Um, and so education was the path for me. Um, you know, I couldn't get around my small town without the ability to drive. Um, and so from that standpoint, um, I, I went to Stanford and um, thought I would be a literature professor and I wanted to focus on disability studies. And then I quickly realized that from like a systemic standpoint, people with disabilities weren't going to be as represented in a disability studies class to, to be my students if certain things weren't shifted in terms of the systems that, that create the, the reality that we live in. So I really became very passionate about doing systemic work in the cross-disability space. Um, I spent time um, doing a lot of different kinds of organizing, um, political fundraising, um, coalition building. Um, I went to law school. Um, I launched organizations. I became a, a, a troublemaker, so to speak, good trouble. and. Um, I, I eventually wound up doing some some policy advocacy work for some national disability organizations and having deep roots and understanding how our issues play out in a cross or pan disability space is extremely helpful in, in the work that I do representing people who are blind and low vision because if we aren't able to really find that consensus and that um, touch point within the disability fold within you know the, the cross disability space um, we have a harder time in pressing on different aspects of policy change at that national federal level um, so i am very happy that i'm at afb i've been here for four years now having spent probably about a dozen years in state and in local government and about a decade in nonprofits. Um, and so long story short, I'm, I'm very passionate about doing digital inclusion work um, that I'm hoping will really be the next frontier in the disability civil rights movement. Very exciting. Daniel, how about you? How did you get into your current line of work? Well, we've got some heavy hitters here. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm more or less... Um, totally blind from birth. I lost both eyes to retinoblastoma uh, by the time I was a year old. Um, I developed my own methods of getting around quite early. In fact, not long after I lost my second eye. So I, even in my earliest memories, I felt and or actually was uh, freely mobile. Mobility is just one of those things that came very easy to me. And it was something that was expected fundamentally from my family. Um, little in the way of technologies back in those days. Uh, even the white cane wasn't uh, um, regularly taught to children with blindness. Um, I'm 56 years old, so we're talking back in the 60s and early 70s. I did have a handheld braille compass from the age of 10, and I, I used that compass. I, I always had that compass with me, and I used it to assist with orientation. So one might say that was sort of the earliest kind of piece of tech <laughs> that I that I use. Um, moving forward a little bit, um, I was an early adopter of Braille note takers. So I was a user of um, one of the first, if not the first, portable standalone Braille note takers, the uh, VersaBraille system uh, from Telesensory Systems. That's going way back. Um, but I've been a, a refreshable Braille display user ever since. Uh, and fast forwarding a bit, um, I uh, ended up getting my master's in developmental psychology, but then realized that psychology wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. And uh, as a, in, in getting my master's, I had to do a thesis and I 
uh, after several uh, iterations and attempts, decided to do my thesis on the development of echolocation in blind children, um, which was not traditionally or routinely taught and which most blind children didn't evidence a, uh, a real level of proficiency. So I thought, well, I mean, it was sort of how I got around and, and, and um, how I was able to do the things I was able to do. So anyway, I developed a curriculum for teaching that um, as part of my master's thesis and then decided uh, to go into orientation and mobility and become certified. And it was only then when I realized that that basically they weren't certifying blind people to do mobility. So I was the first totally blind person known to be certified as an orientation and mobility specialist. Um, I experimented with uh, mobility technologies very early on. Um, I experimented with, with the MOAT, with the Polaron. I'm dating myself. Those are just old uh, ultrasonic-based systems. Um, fast forwarding a bit more, um, there was a real need, I felt, in the orientation and mobility field for um, more effective, more efficient, more impactful methods of training, teaching, methods of navigating, um, even instructional methodologies I took issue with. So um, that's kind of where I started World Access for the Blind was to fill that gap, which I felt was considerable. I still feel it's considerable. So um, I... Uh, have been working, World Access to the Blind has been working largely on a consultative basis uh, with individuals. We've taught thousands by now um, of students, and I've moved into uh, trying to get knowledge and know-how and learning processes in the hands of consumers directly, basically pulling uh, uh, the knowledge away from institutions, um, wresting the knowledge away from institutions, uh, and putting it in the hands of consumers to guide their own learning development, particularly in the areas of mobility, where I feel we have quite failed um, that population or in, in, in that in that area. So, um, so I've been working a lot with virtual technologies. Um, uh, soundscape, seeing AI, some GPS apps, and developing a learning platform, a virtual uh, self-guided DIY learning platform that's based quite heavily in binaural technologies. So binaural recording technologies where you have a three-dimensional immersive uh, capture of uh, the auditory world. There's a video component as well, but the audio component uh, is is considerable in that I figured out how to externalize the frontal dimension. So basically, what is in front of you sounds like it's in front of you. So now that we've captured the frontal dimension through binaural recordings, we can uh, design a, a, a wide range of auditory experiences that blind people can learn from, that gives blind people another option, another opportunity to learn from. So that kind of brings me into the the, the technical space uh, and where it meets navigation and mobility. Wonderful, very interesting. Stephanie, I wanted to ask you, what, what technologies do you use to overcome accessibility barriers you encounter in your daily life? And what features do you find to be most useful and least useful? Um, all right. So I think for me, this has changed over time because I have uh, a condition that has um, shifted and my vision has deteriorated over um, my, my teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s. And so from that standpoint, today, I can say that I do use things like a closed circuit television or video magnifiers, mostly for identification purposes, um, meaning I can quickly identify something. Um, I find this a little bit easier to use than actually other apps or services that are tailored towards giving me the same the same feedback loop. Um, so it's not that I'm using them to really like read anything um, more than maybe one word. Um, and so that's that's the use that I have for that type of technology. But in terms of computers, I would say it's really that blend between using screen reading and screen magnifying um, 
uh, technology. Um, I am more heavily reliant on the screen reading aspect of it. Um, and I do use the screen uh, magnification mostly so I can color reverse. I'm very light sensitive. And often other settings that would accomplish the same thing for screen magnification purposes, they they do funky things <laughs> to, to what you're trying to work with. And so um, when you're usually working with some sort of a program that's focused on screen magnification, it it just is has better options in terms of what you can do um, to change the amount of glare that I'm getting back from from whatever screen type I'm in front of. Um, to a more limited extent, I do use services like Ira, um, and and that's usually to read something very brief. Um, I would prefer if I'm going to read something more extensively to have kind of a digital version that I can use screen um, reading technology to digest. Um, and and also because of privacy concerns, which I think we might touch on later. Um, and so from that standpoint, you know, it, it's definitely this blend. I can only really speak for myself. Oh, I know I do use dictation software um, when um, completing certain tasks on my phone or an iPad because it's much easier than being able to actually um, use um, the other functions to be able to type. Um, and I'm not the kind of person that carries around um, a wireless keyboard that interfaces with this. So um, I do rely on dictation. Um, and I, I am sad that dictation will often scramble things um, that that I actually try to say more, um, uh, more perfectly <laughs> than it captures. Um, in terms of really where the community is, I, I do want to tailor that this is, my comments are, are purely my own experience and every person who has a visual disability is really like their own unique version and composite in terms of like their training, their experience, their technology education, all of that, their access. Um, I know that from our research at the American Foundation for the Blind that a, a very um, wide um, cross-section of people that are employed in the United States are um, heavy users of screen reading technology. Um, many more uh, as well do use screen magnification um, technology, as well as a variety of note-taking devices, both braille note takers, um, iPads, and other things like that to be able to capture notes while on the go. Um, and those are some of the most prevalent technology-based um, accommodations in the American workplace, at least. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Robin, I'm wondering if you have anything else to add in terms of the um, benefits or um, the features that you like to use. Um, well, I'll totally agree with Stephanie that every blind person is completely different. Um, I have no useful vision at all. I did when I was younger. So I went to a normal uh, mainstream school. And so I have no Braille. I tried to pick it up a little bit later on, but I'm ashamed to say that um, I desperately need to brush up on my Braille because it's a, an extra string to your bow and there's definite use cases for it. Um, my go-to technology myself personally, uh, I should also say that AbilityNet, we're independent of any suppliers or providers of technology, but we need to be aware of all of them. So I, I feel like I'm abreast of the, the full range of technologies, you know, certainly in the VI area, but, you know, pan disability as well. So I feel like I'm kind of, aware of what's out there. But what I've chosen personally is a Mac uh, with voiceover. I have no useful vision, as I say, but I have to have a VM on it. I have to have VMware Fusion with uh, Windows 10 still and JAWS. And I'm probably 75% of the time in the Windows side of things because you just cannot get the same sort of productivity going with particularly Office apps with, with the Mac and voiceover in my efforts, you know, despite my efforts anyway. Um, my iPhone, I would say, is at the center of my kind of love of technology. And we've mentioned, you know, seeing AI and Soundscape both happen to be Microsoft apps. Um, I'm really heartened to hear that Daniel's working with Microsoft to kind of improve things in that area, particularly in the kind of binaural, uh, you know, immersive audio space. Huge fan of binaural audio. And I love the fact that the AirPods 3 support um, surround, no, not, uh, what's it called? Positional audio. Um, just like the Bose frames used to. Um, so yeah, and as far as uh, what Stephanie was saying about um, using, you know, AI versus humans, I certainly do use Ira and Be My Eyes from time to time. 
um, usually when the AI has failed to come up with the goods. So I'm really looking forward to improvements in AI and machine learning. I would probably say the thing for me that is least useful, um, even though I was cited at one point, is anything video related. I mean, if it delivers the same quality of content um, in the narrative or in the audio description, then great. But I always get frustrated whenever I try to watch TV or movies, etc. I feel like the AD is just throwing us some crumbs and you don't get nearly as good pictures as you do if you go for, say, the audiobook version. So I would always go audio first whenever possible. So yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. You know, something that we've heard repeatedly from members of the computer vision community who have not interacted with people who are blind is surprised that people who are blind are able to take good pictures and videos to solicit visual assistance when using technologies like Be My Eyes, Ira, uh, Sing AI. And so um, I'll punt this to Daniel first. Could you share a bit about your journey in developing photography skills needed to to use visual assistance technologies, as well as any ongoing photography challenges that you have? Well, it's done my head in. Um, first of all, I should say, uh, you know, going back to um, the idea that no one blind person can speak for any other, let alone all others. Um, I have had a lot of experience with photography not doing photography, but being around photographers. Um, uh, not, not blowing my own horn at all, but I've been involved in so many media pieces, media segments, documentaries. If you do a Google search on me, you'll find out more about me than I myself know. Um, and it just goes on for page after page after page after page. So literally hundreds and hundreds of video shoots. And I have managed to absorb what a lot of photographers do, what they're looking for, what they're not looking for, lighting, framing, angle, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I never cared that much. I mean, I'm glad that I can take a good photo of something, you know, for someone else to review or for AI to review. Uh, I am a seeing AI user. Traditionally, I've been pretty old school. Like I was not a ready adapter of technology. Other than my, you know, white cane and my compass, I was practically you know, navigationally tech free until about 2018, oh, maybe. <laughs> I dabbled a little with Blind Square and a few of, of, of the other GPSs. Um, but it wasn't until Soundscape came on the scene and seeing AI that I really started using them more avidly. Um, with seeing AI, it's mostly short text. Um, so I feel like I've, I've become accustomed to interpreting AI poetry, I call it. Um, getting an idea of what AI is trying to tell you. Um, uh, Soundscape, I'm a pretty regular user of it when I'm traveling in unfamiliar places, which is most of the time. Um, I will say this. Um, uh, I do rely pretty heavily on the Apple image or scene analyzer uh, when I'm taking video. So... When I am setting up the camera, framing, angle, um, lighting, etc., uh, I'll do it through the Apple camera first. And um, although it, the things it will say are a little bit random and a little bit arbitrary, it can get really, give really useful information in terms of the scene that the camera is actually seeing. But what I really do to, to do the framing is I have it look at my face. It wants human faces. It grabs at human faces. It craves human faces. So I can position my face at various points in the camera's view to get the framing right and the angle right. Um, uh, uh, I, ha I have used it to get information from the environment. So for example, if I'm looking for a park bench, um, you know, that can be quite a lengthy process. You have several acres of park and you're looking for a bench, but uh, using the Apple camera, I can usually spot a bench and then using echolocation, I can get myself to the bench, right? Because the camera is going to get you near the bench, but not even necessarily within Kane's length of a bench. So if you're not able to image your surroundings at some distance, you're still likely to miss it. But the camera definitely will give you that kind of information if you know what to look for and how to angle the camera and so forth. So that's kind of a, yeah, I don't 
count myself as any kind of photographer. I'm not trying to make my mark as a blind photographer or video videographer in any way, shape, or form. But I do it because I think that our uh, learning platform needs a video component in order to be all inclusive. Very interesting. Yes. Stephanie, I'm wondering if you have other photography skills or strategies that you've developed when using assistive technologies or whatnot. I mean, none of them are unique um, from what's already been discussed. You know, I can think of features that I I would love, and it's mostly because I have two young children, you know, to know if everybody's eyes are are open and everybody is smiling. That would be amazing <laughs> to know if you captured mm -hmm. that. And I don't think that, please let me know if anyone knows if there's features that actually give that level of detail, because I'll often use, as Daniel has described, use the existing features to be able to frame and, and all of that sort of thing. But I can't get that level of understanding as to whether or not I've captured something where I actually get all the faces you know, <laughs> directly looking in the right way, potentially smiling and not frowning or sticking out their tongue and <laughs> eyes open. I mean, without layers of yes, I think that's technology. A, uh, yeah. That's important for all of our photographs, I think. One sledgehammer approach to that would be to just hold the shutter button down and do a burst of, you know, 50 photos and then get somebody to choose one that's the most... Uh, I've definitely so. done that approach, <laughs> so... <laughs> so when thinking when speaking about uh visual assistance technologies you know for a few years now computer vision researchers have been developing models for tackling two tasks of describing images and one task is to to create captions for images and the second task is to answer questions about images um and Robin, I'm wondering, you know, if you could talk about the usefulness of these two different types of approaches in practice. Um, and in doing so, if you could comment on if one approach is preferable um, over another. Sure. I mean, the main reason why people with very little or no vision are using a camera is to get information. It's not necessarily to take a masterpiece. So, you know, what they need to know about is what we've been talking about, you know, what's in shot. Um, the lighting, ideally, the software would kind of compensate for as much as possible. But, um, you know, once you've taken that photograph or if it's a live image, you know, in the, in the short text channel of, um, seeing AI, for example, once you've kind of got that information, then like you say, the two main things are knowing what's in the image, i.e. being able to tag objects and also to get, get meaning from that image to interpret the kind of all the objects together and give you the context or the kind of is it trying to convey something? And that's often where you get a description all pulled together, uh, where the, the machine learning or the AI component of seeing AI, for example, tries to summarize that in a sentence, just pulling out, you know, the key things that would give you a description of that image in an, in a nutshell. I was talking to Saqib Sheikh a week before last, I think it was about this challenge in seeing AI and um, I was saying, you know, it'd be fantastic if uh, you had the ability to get as much information as you can from the um, scene preview channel, which is, um, sorry, the scene channel, which is in preview, uh, that's like beta, uh, versus the um, one where you take a snap of um, the, you know, just what's in the image and it'll tell you, oh, it's a person or whatever. And they're basically two different API calls and they, they, haven't really got control over those. So the first one, you take an image and it looks at some objects in there, it throws away all the other information and it comes back and it says, in this picture, I can see A, B, and C, you know, some a pair of trainers, sneakers, um, a, a mug on and a coffee table, that sort of thing. Um, and the other one, which it uses for this scene preview where you can then explore by touch the relative, um, the relationship between what's in the image. That's a, that's my favorite channel, by the way, being able to roam around, you can get the exact kind of edges of, you know, if I took a picture in front of me here, I've got my monitor in front of me and I can, you know, trace the exact edges, extent of that monitor in that view. And that's a very different API. That's where you get a lot of information that is just, um, available in that, in that mode. So it's really hard to pull those two together. And I think that's one of the challenges that they're trying to address going forward. So as you know, in the same shot, 
you can get all of that information plus you can get the, the context overview. And at the moment, those two are completely different processes. So, you know, I think they're looking at bringing those together. So, yeah, um, we're also working with City University in London, for trying to train a range of objects that are much more like the sort of things that a visually impaired person would be looking for, a braille display, a white cane, that sort of thing. But not only that, because some of those are in the standard models um, that, you know, are available that seeing AI, for example, can take advantage of. But the um, the way that they're captured for somebody who can't see what they're doing is often very, very different. So they wanted lots of blind people to take photographs of the devices that they use most commonly or want to find in a range of settings that are really quite um, inhospitable. So, you know, on the sofa, half hidden under a cushion or on the floor with the shadow of the table over it, you know, making it really difficult to see. So um, to be able to enhance or augment the machine learning models that these apps are using, um, the sort of standard ones with ones that are much more kind of VI specific, I think is going to really improve the, um, the utility of these apps going forward. And I'm really excited about that as well. Thank you for sharing that information about object recognition. Uh, Daniel, I was curious if you had uh, insight into kind of when these systems that allow you to ask visual questions are the most useful in comparison to the, the captioning of objects. Well, I work a lot in what I call the navigational space. So not, not so much, you know, where is my note taker, but uh, where is the picnic table? Where is the entrance to the shopping mall? Where is the, um, the, the push button, you know, for the for a pedestrian crossing? Um, that sort of thing. Where is the path? <laughs> where isn't the path? So um, uh, I've often thought that a, a query format would be useful. It's obvious that cameras can recognize things like a park bench, like a, I don't know, a, a monument, a body of water, a bus shelter. Um, and uh, if we can get AI to be smart enough to parse through those questions and actually match it with an answer, I see a lot of utility for that. Otherwise, you're just basically scrubbing for, through a lot of information, most of which is superfluous or, or not particularly useful. Very helpful. Thank you. So shifting topics a little bit, um, I'm curious from each of you what your thoughts are about researchers or industry service providers collecting and using data to provide visual assistance in order to improve existing algorithms and developing new algorithms to provide visual assistance. Um, Stephanie, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. Um, I mean, I have a lot of feelings about it, um, if especially wearing, you know, a legal hat. Um, and from that standpoint, I feel like a lot of the the predicaments that individuals are placed in that are considering whether or not to use a particular service for accomplishing a particular task is that we're really putting the accessibility that people are striving for against privacy issues. Um, and, and from that standpoint, I don't think that that's necessarily fair and that there are some service providers that are asking for a, a legal uh, right, like for example, a license to the content that they can capture um, within these sessions um, when they don't necessarily need an actual legal license. Um, they may need access to it for that time period, but it should be able to be noted that the content can be deleted in a particular time frame and that they don't have existing rights to it beyond a particular set amount of time. Um, and so what I'm really speaking to is that my, my feelings are rooted in the fact that I don't think that people need to have have that choice as stark as it is between being able to get that level of accessibility from a service and privacy. And so I'm really hopeful that services will hear that there um, is a need to better describe exactly what the purpose is for the kind of rights that they're um, requiring 
that they will speak to the fact that data that is collected um, will be deleted and on a particular time frame, um, and that people have information very transparent and very easy to understand related to how, when, and why um, content that is captured in these sorts of sessions and contexts um, needs to be used um, and for the types of purposes that it can be used for. And I, I hope that was responsive, but <laughs> I'm not trying to call out anyone in particular, which is why I wasn't speaking um, in specifics. <laughs> Very much so. It's it's a very contemporary question and something that needs to be looked at. Robin, I'm curious if you have um, additional thoughts around um, the collection of data to provide visual assistance. Well, um, certainly about data privacy um, more generally, I'm probably not the right person to ask because I do a daily um, podcast about the Echo, the Amazon Echo. So, um, but anyway. I think it's really, really important um, that Apple, for example, are going much more on device when it comes to processing of this information. And of course, the models that they use um, that hopefully have been trained to be better at recognizing, um, you know, things that aren't totally in frame, poor lighting, uh, you know, all the things that we were talking about earlier, the objects that visually impaired people need to be able to find, um, those can be done locally. The model, you know, can be on the local device and that machine learning, you know, can leverage the power of the silicon on there. And that obviously has a, an impact or an import for privacy, for data privacy. Things don't have to be uploaded and, and crunched on, you know, a, a server somewhere. And there's a huge um, broader context about bandwidth or, or access to the internet. You know, there's many developing countries where it really does need to be on device. And there's a lot of visually impaired people in those countries for whom on device uh, smarts would be absolutely essential for them. So yeah, I think uh, Google have had a lot to say in this space more recently as well, but I think on device is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and thinking about how these companies can communicate to users how the data is being collected, processed, um, and stored and whatnot. Um, you know, several ideas have been creating records of a, a data lineage. Um, you know, essentially the decisions that are being made with the data and how. And I'm just curious if you guys have heard very much about uh, the use of instruments that help support the communication of these practices and your perspectives about how that information can be more widely communicated to the community. Although I, uh, Daniel, I don't, maybe I'll you know, shoot that one to you or Stephanie. I, I, I don't know exactly Stephanie. how everybody in the community feels, but I think that there is probably a pretty uh, large information gap um, between what people really know and what people also understand um, in terms of, you know, what this data is, is, is doing or who has access to it for what purposes and for how long and et cetera. Um, and so I think that there is a huge information gap to to kind of conquer <laughs> in this space. And I think that people would probably feel differently if they had more knowledge and potentially transparency in that space. Very helpful. Daniel, what are your thoughts around uh, data collection and data communication, data handling communication? The, the, the broad picture, I know for myself that privacy is important, particularly per personal privacy. So I'm, I'm not an avid uh, my eyes or eye rig user. Um, and the main reason for that is maybe just my own proclivities and maybe it's partly age thing as well. Um, I just am uncomfortable with a perfect stranger looking at my face. Not only looking at my space, but essentially looking at other spaces. Because I may or may not know exactly where that camera is pointing or what that camera is seeing exactly. But when it comes to my own personal space, yeah, I, I which is an odd thing to say considering how public um, I am about 
a lot of things. Everyone's seen my home. <laughs> so I'm not sure what the issue is, but there is an issue with me. So, um, and I remember being interviewed by Be, Be My Eyes at one point. They, they called me, no idea why, to participate in a survey about their services. I told them up front that I wasn't really a user of their service. They wanted my input anyway. And according to the interviewer, he was really surprised because I was the first person to raise that particular issue. I was the first person that he'd surveyed to raise the issue of privacy. So be that as it may, um, that's one of the main issues I have personally when it comes to using those services. Now, professionally, um, I'm up for anything that liberates people. I'm up for anything that um, facilitates the execution of responsible personal freedom. That's very important. Um, and I'm thinking with these visual assistant technologies, um, we're talking about you know the the use of AI and possibly the data collection um, to enhance the AI. I'm I'm curious, you know. If there, what level of interaction do you want from a visual assistant technology that interprets the visual information? And you know, do you prefer that the interaction comes from humans or computers? And I'll stay with you, Danielle, for that question. Is that to me? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the audio is skipping for some reason. I don't know why. Um, uh, I definitely prefer interacting with AI, but then I'm a diehard introvert who's also on the spectrum, so I don't know that I'm very representative in that regard. Um, but uh, privacy is one of those reasons. Uh, I I guess I feel I feel like you know AI is just going to dispassionately provide whatever information it knows, whatever information it can, uh, and it doesn't really care. What is looking at, what the context, is. Uh, whereas humans un undoubtedly and unquestionably do, um, and so interacting with a human is just a very different. Gosh, it's a very different. Experience. I'm not saying it should be eliminated. It's just not an experience that I personally. That makes a lot of sense, Stephanie. I'm curious what your preference is in terms of using humans or AI to receive visual assistance. I mean, I I do think um, I'm I am somewhat old school from the standpoint that I I would always prefer a human o over technology when I'm trying to get questions answered because I feel like a human is is going to understand and field the question um, differently than anything that is is in a created space. Um, but I think that there's a dichotomy. You know, there's different kinds of tasks that I have that are visual that are you know, fixed through this technology. So if this is purely for enjoyment, I want, let's say, um, a piece of my children's art described vividly to me, you know, I am comfortable with that being, um, you know, a created computer space, you know, because I, I don't feel like there's anything um, that I would need to, to ask as follow up. It's purely for enjoyment. Whereas if I'm trying to make a decision about something and I may have some direct follow-up questions, I'm not always, you know, certain that I'm going to be able to get exactly what I need in the fastest way possible um, in a time crunch situation from computers. Robin, what's your perspective about the use of humans versus AI for image description and visual assistance? I would definitely agree with Stephanie that it's a, a case by case. It's a use case uh, thing. So when it comes to you know scanning a document or, or taking a paper document that you want to deal with later on, then a quick snap with your camera, you know the OCR side of AI is startlingly good these days. So it really depends on what you know leaning to the strengths of the AI. Um, so that sort of thing is great. Um, you know product recognition like grabbing barcodes. It's still really you know hit and miss. So um, unless we had one of those kind of industrial uh, strength um, barcode scanners, which I think use infrared instead. So maybe there would be a, a plug in for, a, you know, like an add on for a, an iDevice, for example, that would make a better job of that. Um, 
but yeah, so when it comes to sort of object recognition or interpretation of visual stuff, I would go human any day of the week. When I'm out and about, I wouldn't choose either AI or human. I would choose a dog. <laughs> and that is absolutely fantastic. I really can't imagine a time. I can't foresee a time. I could imagine one, but I can't foresee a time in the near future when AI plus haptics plus any kind of robotic uh, intervention would have the same level of... Um, you know, uh, potential hazard avoidance and just seamless. I mean, I'm, I, I, I shouldn't do this, but I always switch off because it's just so effortless. And I'm at my destination and I, I wasn't even aware of the kind of road crossings and stuff in between. So it's kind of that level of ease when it comes to a guide dog. So yeah, I'd love there to be a case in the future when um, AI is best for all of these because not everyone has access to a guide dog or a human, et cetera. Um, but yeah, we're not there yet. Great. So we're coming to an end. And while we've touched on these topics kind of throughout this conversation, I'm curious from your perspectives, you know, what are the most important open accessibility obstacles today that should be solved first? And I just want to note that we will have computer vision researchers um, in the audience. And um, so one may be inspired to even pursue your ideas. So, you know, if you can share about your individual perspectives as well as um, any other ideas that you hear from the broader community with the understanding that uh, everybody has a unique preference. Um, maybe Danielle, we'll start with you on this question. Again, not wanting to speak for everyone, but if I, if I were to collapse, uh, the experiences I've had, my own personal experiences, I've, I've been to over 40 countries and I've worked with over 3,000 students of every imaginable age and background. I, I guess I would say it's interesting because even avid travelers, good travelers who've had a lot of experience and a lot of proficiency, sometimes there's just maybe one thing that they struggle with uh, in terms of mobility or navigating. And that one thing can prevent the trip. You know, it can prevent learning a particular route. It can prevent learning to get to a particular place. Um, and it's different for different people. Uh, for many, it's road crossings. Um, we manage to fear of God into blind people when it comes to road crossings. Uh, for many, crossing over open space uh, and being able to target your destination accurately and efficiently. Uh, for some, it's uh, mediating interaction. So, who is where is the person I'm looking for? Kind of thing. Um, for many, it's recreation and leisure. Uh, especially in some countries, some more than others, we've marginalized or isolated or excluded blind people right out of uh, peer based recreation and leisure. So that's moving quickly, moving through complex spaces, being able to uh, to uh, uh, avoid or 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 interact with environmental features. So I guess I'm kind of in a way saying everything, but it boils down to interacting with specific elements or features in complex spaces, crossing open space, and dealing with uh, dealing with vehicular traffic the social environment, and then, of course, seamless access to the symbolic environment, so public signage, labels, and markups. Robin, what are the most important accessibility, open accessibility challenges today that you think should be solved first? Um, I can't believe I'm going to say this because a large part of what Ability It does day to day is advocating for digital accessibility and helping organizations to make their websites and mobile apps more inclusive. But it's going, it is a long journey and it's going to carry on being a long journey. And whilst we also spend a lot of time telling um, companies that these accessibility plugins, I'm not going to name any names, but you know who you are that purport to be the silver bullet um, aren't, and in some cases can actually degrade the uh, accessibility of a website, um, particularly for a screen reader user, um, there's still gonna be this gaping gap in, in accessibility because you know, com companies are slow to adopt, they find it daunting or they're you know, SMBs and they haven't got the kind of bandwidth to do that. So 
there is a large area where AI can be better applied to um, patching accessibility. That's a terrible thing to say, but you know, I feel like we need to go there. Where does vision, you know, related AI come in? Well, the page that you're looking at gets a lot of context from the the overall visual structure of it, the layout, the relationship of one page element to another, you know, think of all the effort that goes into user testing and heat maps and stuff like that. There are nuances there that you just don't get as a blind person when the page is linearized, regardless of how much semantic information is there with headings, etc. But so I feel like there is an overlap there. It's certainly a domain where AI can have a better impact and at the very least not actually degrade the experience when a plugin is added to a site, um, hopefully improve it. Um, but also I think there's a lot of the visual aspects of a web page or a, the UI of a mobile app that could be better machine understood. And somehow that could be layered onto the experience of blind users, for example, um, who don't get any of the visuals of what they're looking at. So yeah, for me, I would say I was a power user when it comes to technology. I still find the internet a really frustrating place. I don't know about you guys. Um, and I just want that to go away as quickly as possible, please. <laughs> Thank you. We, I hear you. Um, and Stephanie, how about for you? What are the most important open accessibility obstacles today that should be solved first? And I'm also curious, um, in your perspective, what are the most effective advocacy efforts to move these ideas forward? I mean, I think that um, for a dynamic issue, like the issues that we've been touching on in this time together, there's really like a whole set of tools in the toolbox. And, you know, there's very important tactics and strategies involved in everything from corporate advocacy to user feedback, to education, to litigation, to policy making. All of these are, are important role makers and tools in chipping away at different aspects of this. Um, one kind of example that I could give is um, the United States has the Captioning and Video Accessibility Act. Um, which has been around for a while. And, you know, in terms of like the user uploaded feedback, I mean, um, uh, user uploaded content, it it's an interesting landscape because, you know, it's, it's something that you could certainly, um, you could attack it from a couple of different angles in terms of, uh, as a problem, um, the the CVAA, the Captioning Video Accessibility Act, it really, for many corporate players, it was seen as like a call to action as to what they should do to be able to create this um, more accessible video programming content. And others really saw this as kind of, um, you know, a, a way or a mechanism to consider and, you know, provide kind of that lowest rung of, of accessibility. Um, and so at this point, you know, there is something that could be done and looking at the CVAA and looking at where it could go from here as kind of a piece of legislation, we're kind of at the at the spot of, you know, refreshing it and looking at it as needing a, another iteration to be able to better spell out some of the intricacies of how to tackle problems. And so I just, I give that as like an example of, you know, there's, there's a problem um, that could be kind of, you know, it could be legislated, it could be, um, you know, you could look at it from, okay, that corporate advocacy angle might just solve everything and it, and it will to a certain extent, it's not going to bring everyone along. And so anytime we're at a spot to be able to make progress with digital inclusion, it's like, you have to think about all of the different tools and what role each of them play in, in kind of crafting the solution. Well, thanks to each of you for, for sharing your expertise. I feel like we've just barely touched the surface. And so hopefully this is the beginning of many more conversations. Um, it's, I'm sure it's very, this conversation is very helpful for our audience. And you know we look forward to the influence of your leadership and advocacy efforts. And we hope that you've enjoyed participating in this panel as well. Um, and so with that, we'll uh, say goodbye.